Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Heritage Park Baptist Church. Please stand and join us in singing.
What a great group of uh, people all scattered over the auditorium it is today. Um, it's good to be here and to be at, at Heritage Park Baptist Church. I just want to say before we begin, and our text is in uh, Luke chapter 7, if you'd like to turn there while I'm, while I'm uh, prefacing this, uh, how much I really appreciate Pastor Kurt and I just, him and his whole family just have been very kind to me and nice to me. When uh, Boston Baptist College uh, eliminated my position because of finances, they, uh, Pastor Kurt and his wife called and went out to eat with us, were just so gracious and kind to us and nice to us, and that's just very um, characteristic of who he is, and I just count him as a dear friend, and I appreciate just being here as well. Um, so... The title of my message is, Am I Under Authority? Um, the 
that's a mark of a lot of issues in the world that we live in today, isn't it? And I think it's a very appropriate message for the 5th of July, the 4th of July weekend. Uh, back in the early 80s in Springfield, Missouri, we lived right across the street from an elementary school, Campbell Elementary School. And uh, it was a busy street. It was Grant Street. It's a, it was uh, probably like the street that runs kind of like through the mall, around the mall here. And so it was pretty busy, and they had a crossing guard like they do in New England, right? But this event played out every weekday during the school year, and we lived two doors down from the traffic light that was on the corner. And you could hear the crossing guard screaming at the top of her lungs. I mean, she obviously had self-esteem issues. Uh, she had the hat, uh, the gloves, the coat, the pants, the shoes. She looked like a neon balloon, actually, you know, just, and she would be screaming at people, don't you move, don't you step out into that until I tell you you can, and people would be going by faster than 20, do you know it's 20 miles an hour here, you know, she'd just be, oh my goodness, it was, and I could hear her in my house two doors away, that's the way, that's how bad it was. And uh, she'd say, I'll take your license. She would scold people while they're sitting there at the stoplight, you know. Uh, it was unbelievable. And then something happened. Like always it, in school zones, every once in a while, police officers will shoot radar on that. And so uh, one of these mornings, a car stopped right in front of my house, and the police officer was right behind him. And I just noticed, and maybe you've seen this by experience, but the police officer uh, just calmly sat in his car. Eventually, he got out, put his hat on, started walking to the car, and the person inside is just squirming, you know. They're just, no, they're going to get it. And I learned something that day that true authority is not when you yell at somebody. Most true authority is calm controlled, and even focused. Now, I don't know if you've ever worked for a crossing guard employer or not, but it's never a pleasant experience when someone's yelling at you, is it? And uh, so I started thinking about that and our story this morning that we find in God's Word. All the military training and police force training is to cause the soldier or police officer to act in a level, deliberate, and measured action, not like that crossing guard. And we live in challenging days when keeping your cool in the armed forces and law enforcement is sometimes very difficult. And when authority is misused or actions done that are totally wrong, it can be and is devastating, not only to the individual and sometimes to the entire nation. Wouldn't you agree with me? This whole idea of authority is something that we need to really consider and rethink. Uh, and with that in mind, I would like to read the first 10 verses of Luke chapter 7. So if you have your, your Bible, would you read God's very own word with me? Now, when he concluded all these, his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that, one, that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loved our nation and has built a synagogue. So Jesus went with them. And when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the words, and my servant will be healed. For I am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well who had been sick. Let's pray. 
God, we thank you for your word. We thank you how powerful it is to our lives. And we pray as we have um, assembled this morning to hear the reading of your word in the sense of it, that our hearts would be open to change. May our lives be ever aware that how we respond to you, the great authority, is the most important thing that we can do. Be with me as I speak that I have the words of God and the fingerprint of him on my life. In Jesus' name. Let me say, before I go into the text, that there is a parallel text to this in Matthew chapter 8. And the only reason I bring this up is because I know that there are many of you that are in this uh, room this morning that are not uh, novices in the Word of God. You probably will take the time to look up the parallel passage in the Synoptic Gospels here. But in Matthew chapter 8, it kind of makes an a, a idea that the centurion actually shows up to Jesus and talks. And there's, there's somewhat of, it, although it's an obvious parallel, same experience passage, you're going to see that uh, it seems like it's a different setting than that. Well, I, let me just say, first of all, people are always, in the days that you and I are living, looking to find discrepancies in the Word of God and say, ha-ha, there's a problem with the text. Well, this is really understandable predominantly in a couple major ideas. First of all, that Matthew was written to a Jewish audience and Luke was written to a Gentile audience. So the way the story is portrayed to those audiences will be dramatically different. Uh, secondly, uh, if, you'll, if you'll read like verses 7 and through 10, you'll see that the centurion is talking. He say, I go, and, I, and so he speaks in the first person, although he has people that are in the crowd, he never actually shows in this passage because we, he read he sent the, the scribes and the Jews, and then he had an envoy of his own servants following. And then, but the dialogue they have is as if he spoke it. And so that's the same kind of scenario. I just say that because I believe in the veracity of the Word of God, and it's explainable. Uh, and I just hate it when people start taking the Bible and begin to pick it apart. And so I thought, uh, as, as a theologian, I think that some of you would be interested in that. I hope that didn't distract you from the actual message. I just want you to know the Bible is incredible, right? And it's something that's worth following in it and following every way. Um, the big question of our passage, uh, that it, what it asks is, are you under Christ's authority? Is it, I think that's an appropriate question for this July 4th weekend. Um, and I don't want to mince, mince words because America started under the authority of God and his word. The Pilgrim um, Manifesto, the, the, the trials and the establishment of that government, which laid a foundation all the way to John Adams. And you'll see that the, the heritage of the Pilgrims, although they became tremendously legalistic and Calvinistic and uh, did a lot to sabotage themselves by enforcing pharisaical laws on people, uh, didn't last. The theme and foundation of the Word of God certainly did last into America. And you can see it in the vestiges of our uh, constitution that was written by John Adams right here in Boston where it just uh, you know he was born just a uh, hundred years after the first uh, ship pulled into Boston Harbor or into Salem and so our nation has been tremendously blessed because of the heritage that we have to follow God and the God of our Bible wouldn't you agree with me on that and at the end of the message pastor Kurt asked me to pick out a video, and so I picked out a video, America, America, God shed his grace on me, God bless America is the theme of that, and it's uh, sung by um, a, a, the Gaither Vocal Band, and so I like it, my wife's not a really big fan of the Gaither, Gaither Vocal Band, but I'm an oldie kind of a guy, so uh, I hope you enjoy that, but while you listen to that video, I just want to, you to think how blessed we are to be established as a nation under the authority of God's word. That is not the case with every other nation. And when it's not, it seems to be, and this happens all too much in our government as well, but it seems to be that you can do whatever you can get by with. There's no moral absolute. And that's not so in the United States of America. So here we are in our passage. 
Uh, Jesus has just completed the Sermon on the Mount. It's what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and actually, verse 7, it says, Now, when he had ended all these sayings, he is, he is up on a mountaintop that overlooks the Sea of Galilee. So let me give you kind of a topographical uh, uh, idea of where we are here. Uh, he's up on this mountain. He comes down the mountain. He goes by Magdala, at, which is, he's probably five miles walking from, from that top of that mountain where his disciples, and he gave the Beatitudes, uh, and he walks down through Magdala. Mary is, Mary Magdalene is from Magdala, so they, they called her by the town that she was from, and then he comes to Capernaum. Now, if he had come down off of that mountain and turned right and gone south, he would have gone toward Nazareth, which was where he was born, and uh, that would be at the other end of the Sea of Galilee, on the, on the south end, but they were going to stone him, if you remember correctly. Uh, he had to walk. He was on the brow of Nazareth. They were going to throw him off the, off the top. And so he left Nazareth, and now he makes his launching point out of Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is on the north. It's the, where the headwaters of the Jordan River come into Capernaum. And Peter lives there. In fact, uh, I've seen where they've excavated his house and the first century synagogue that's right there. there there was a third and fourth century synagogue and then below that and one of my friends actually helped the uh, the archaeologist archaeologist uh, pick through that and uh, establish the synagogue there in in Capernaum now Capernaum the city is about 1500 people and the walls of the city are probably not much higher than my head so it's not a it's not a fortified city by any stretch of the imagination. Not like Jerusalem, you know, with the 50, 60, 70 feet high uh, stone walls. But uh, they're, just, uh, they're just really t- kind of a deterrent, maybe. And it's about as big, the whole city of Capernaum, because about half the city would live outside the walls. The whole city would probably sit inside the parking lot of the Burlington Mall. That's outside and inside. And I would say the walls of the mall, you know how disjointed they are? That was about how the walls of Capernaum were. They, were, they moved and, and did that. And they would probably be about the dimensions of what the mall itself would be. Does that give you kind of a perspective of what Capernaum would be? And because they're the sea, it's on the, the Capernaum hits right against the Sea of Galilee, on the south, everybody that lived on the south had a view of the beautiful Sea of Galilee, but there was only one road in, and that was across the Jordan River, and that was into Capernaum, and that's where Matthew sat at the receipt of customs, and that all this has something to do with this story because it's just incredible. Do you guys like my little geography lesson here? So uh, it kind of gives you an idea of where, he, where he's at. Uh, now, a centurion commanded a group of about 80 to 100 men. He probably was not a Roman citizen, although because he he was probably a volunteer in the army and rose through the ranks. So finally, um, maybe he'd be like a junior officer, a non-com or a sergeant, something like that. When When he was given this authority, he was made a centurion and probably given Roman citizenship at that time. So he was probably a Roman citizenship, had Roman citizenship, and with that, He probably was vested with a group of indentured uh, servants, or they called them slaves. Now, these these are not the slaves that were, like, born into slavery, but they came into hard times. And so rather than send their whole family to jail, they would sell themselves for a certain number of years to someone. Boston did this, actually. There were people that couldn't afford to come over from England. And so they would make connection with people here in Boston, and Boston would send, the, the people would then send a payment for that person to come over, and they would, they would uh, serve them for seven years, and then they would be free to get whatever job that they ever had. I don't know if you knew that, but the, a lot of them lived below the little houses that you see in the, in the center of town. And so, uh, so when we think of slave, we don't, we're probably not quite getting it. It's more of like I'm earning my freedom kind of a scenario. And so some of these people would be very competent, qualified. Maybe he was an amanuensis. He could write. Maybe he could uh, settle the books. You know, more than just a day laborer type of person. And he had become very, 
much endeared to this centurion. Maybe he was like on his last year before he became free, and then he got terribly sick. That we, we aren't given the whole story of this, but at some point, it, the Bible says that this, is, that this centurion was a remarkable Roman officer because he loved this servant and cared about him. It also says that he was a man that cared about uh, God because he had, had even though the Jews hated the Gentiles and hated the Roman oppressors, which he represented with all this authority. Um, he looked through that and passed that, and he even built the synagogue in Capernaum that I was just talking about. Is that incredible? I know who I know who who built that. Now, the synagogue in Capernaum is uh, not as big as this room, um, it, but it's not it's not half the size. It's, it's probably from about here and, and maybe to the back. So it's, it's no small little room. And it was built out of uh, stone. So they had to be chopped and, and placed in the uh, place. And the, the floor is still ex- extant and you can walk on it. So it was a very expensive endeavor. I don't, I don't know how much it would cost, but I would say... It would be a lifetime wage for somebody probably to be able to afford that. So this man was a man of, of competency and wealth. And uh, he, his servant was at a point of death. He had all the power of Rome behind him, but that's not good right now. He has quite a bit of wealth, but that's not going to make much difference either. He has faith in God, and he's heard about the ministry and power of Jesus Christ. If he could only get the message to to Jesus. So he says, maybe Jesus is a Jew that won't accept me as a Gentile. I know just what I'll do. I've helped them build a synagogue. So he goes to the Jewish leaders of Capernaum, who don't like Jews, very, don't like Gentiles very much at all. I don't know, maybe they've got another fundraiser coming. But anyway, he implores them to go find Jesus. A Gentile asking Jewish leaders to do it. And so, begrudgingly, I imagine, they set off to find Jesus. And like we read in the passage, they find Jesus, and they say, this centurion servant is really sick. He's a good person. In fact, he built the synagogue. Like, hint, hint, he is important to us. Can't you go and and see him? And It doesn't say, I'm sure Jesus had spoken in this synagogue as well. So, I mean, I don't think that it would have been knowledge that that would have been new to Jesus that that he knew the actual centurion. And so he, the Bible says, so he went and and started going toward this centurion, his house. Uh, It obviously was not in Capernaum. And as he walked out the gate, and probably going right down past Matthew at this time, uh, another group of people come as emissaries from this centurion. Now, this is where I see a person who's in authority and smart and tactical. He sends the Jewish leaders first, kind of to make sure that Jesus will go and that he doesn't pull the I don't see Gentile card that he thinks might happen because he's living in an occupied country of Romans. So he gets the Jews to speak, and as soon as he starts moving that way, I think these group of people are probably staged. The Bible says he hasn't gone very far from that toward his house before this other group of people come. And here's their message. You saw it. They said, uh, these are the words that the centurion tells him to say, I'm not worthy for you to even come under my house. I know what it is to take orders. I say go, they go. I say come, you come. I say do this, they do that. All you have to say is let it be done, it will be done. And Jesus stops in the crowd. It says he looks back at this crowd now of Jewish leaders and Gentiles all together. Isn't this a great message? And he says there's no faith like this in all of Israel. Pushing against the, Gentile, the Jews that, that live by their works. And then those who are coming and saying, I don't know if this is, this is asking so much of him. In both 
perspectives they get the message just for them isn't that a great message of a person that speaks uh, one message that has two listening audiences here. And that's how the Word of God is, isn't it? That as it goes forth, somebody over here might hear what the Holy Spirit wants them to hear in that regard. Someone over here with a completely different lifestyle and a different setting will hear, will hear something like that. And he recognized who, God, tr- who Jesus truly was and thought of himself as being unworthy and even stand, to stand in Jesus' presence. You know, this is not something that's unusual to the scriptures. You're going to find as the early church comes forward that there are people that are saved out of Herod's household. You'll also find one of the, uh, Shirley and I were reading in her, Shirley has this reading plan that she was telling me, this is really a credible, incredible reading plan. And isn't, isn't the age that you and I live in a, filled with great opportunities for us to read God's word and plans? And she talked about this manu- manuus who was a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch that was one of the key leaders of the early church at Jerusalem. So see, it's not unusual for the early church to have Gentiles that were in great authority. And I was just wondering, like, wow, could that have been the guy, you know? Or could it have been somebody else? But at some point, Jesus, of course, made no difference between Gentiles and Jews. I like that little song that I learned when I was just a child. You probably did too. Red and yellow, black and white. They're precious in his sight. Jesus loves the children of the world, all the children of the world. The answer for our country is the authority of Jesus Christ. He loves everybody the same. You'll not find him treating one race or one class different than the other. And it's part of our responsibility as believers in Jesus Christ to love the Jews, to love the Gentiles, to love the red and yellow, black and white, all the same, and to speak truth in their lives and to love them like Jesus Christ did. I think this passage lets us know how God feels about people who have faith and a heart for God. I see two really basic applications that I'd like for you to see, and I think he's going to put them up on the board right now. First of all, the more we love God, the more we need God in our lives because we realize our weakness and we realize uh, our inabilities. And secondly, the more we love God, the more we realize that he's the only answer to our problems. So let me kind of just talk about this first one. Um, We need God in our lives because we realize our weakness and our inabilities. Here's a man who built an entire building for worship. And if someone asked him, Mr. Centurion, why do you build buildings like this? I don't think he would say, well, I want God to be indebted to me. That wasn't even the situation that he said. But, you know, I would sense that there are a lot of people that would say he would have had an ulterior motive. He could have said to Jesus, You know, I built a building for you guys. The least you could do is come and see my servant in healing. Wouldn't you think that would be a a tact that you could imply to somebody along that line? But he doesn't use that at all. Uh, He could have said that um, I am a junior officer in the army of the Roman government, the strongest, most powerful government in the world. And I order you to come see my servant. He could have done that, couldn't he? But you know the remarkable thing about this, and I think this is, this is so different than the world you and I live in because we live in this authority. He came to Jesus realizing he didn't have any chance unless Jesus did it. And he couldn't order it. He didn't have that kind of... It was above his pay grade to order Jesus to do something for him. Um, I've had some heart issues and I went, I, I was talking with the doctor over the phone. You know how uh, you have your, your meetings with the doctor? I was billed $400 for a phone call, a 10-minute phone call. I'm going like, oh, but uh, that's when you're glad you have insurance. And, and I said to him, he, so, he said something to me because I had witnessed to him. And he goes, well, preacher, what I do in anything is, power, is as important as what you do. And I said, well, you know, a heart doctor is not something you just, you know, you don't have but one of those, I said to him. And he goes, well, what you do is really, really important. 
Uh, I also had a senator pr from the state of Missouri say something to me that was something like that, that what you do is much more important than what I do. You know, the truth is, anything we do for Jesus Christ is the most important thing you can do. It exceeds whatever job you have, how much money you have, how much influence, whether you are a blue blood, um, whether you, you know, our world is just crazed about this dynasty and these, these uh, women that run around the Kardashian-type scenario, you know, and they just flaunt how important they are. Do you know what? None of us are very important when it comes to Jesus Christ. Do you know how hard that would have been for a centurion to learn? I think it's something that you and I ought to think about. Sometimes we have the audacity to think that, God, since I serve you, you owe this to me. God doesn't owe anything to us. If, if you'd like to read Psalm 34, though, David says, God, I love you. I serve you with my whole heart. And because of that, here's my request. I, I just don't want you to get the feeling that because he is so much higher than us that we don't have any right to ask him because that is certainly not the, the, the reality of it. The Bible says that we're to go boldly into the throne of grace. We're joint heirs with Jesus. Our position with Jesus Christ is amazing. But this centurion realized that he was helpless and hopeless without Jesus Christ. You and I are like that as well, aren't we? We're in a hopeless world. I think we live in the last days. I think in Ephesians it talks about this. We, we live in times of pestilence. Wouldn't you agree that all of us sitting here with our, with our mask close or ready or on, that there's a pandemic that we never thought would be capable in America. But it's here. Uh, I, I talked with um, a person that works with the Massachusetts state government, and he said, and don't you think that our enemies aren't considering the greatest way to attack America is not militarily, but through this same kind of way that this virus Boy, I'm just telling you, that scares me to death. But I'm just telling you, that it says there's famines, wars of rumors of wars. This last week, there was a headline that said that Russia was putting out uh, money as a, as a connection to kill any American. They would pay the Afghanistan stands a ransom to, to, uh, to kill American soldiers. I'm just saying, our world is really a dangerous place. We live in the last times. And the only answer for America and for our world is Jesus Christ. Uh, Shirley and I in our church support the democracies in Greece, and you've seen the flood of immigrants from Iran, Iraq, Syria, uh, coming across the land bridge as well as uh, the water to get to Athens. And the democracies, they led three to the Lord, had 17 baptized last week. They have led hundreds. How many? Uh, it's amazing. They've had thousands of people saved in the last year because God's rewarding their faithfulness. Do you see, in these perilous and turbulent times, people are trying to figure out what's the real answer. And this centurion said, I know the real answer. It's not the Roman government. It's not even the Jewish race. It's Jesus. Boy, that's something all of us need to hear. The first place we ought to go when we have problems in our life is Jesus. And that's where he was. Because of his weakness and, and inability, he came to understand Jesus was the only answer. Only he can satisfy, satisfy our hopes, our, our, our problems. When he came to his limits in humility, he approaches the one who is limitless. And this centurion has provided us with a picture of what it really means to know Jesus Christ as the Lord of our lives. I'm afraid that all too often we accept Christ as our, a child, and then just kind of wander our, the rest of our life thinking how a child thinks about this relationship instead of thinking, look at the gravity of the sin that I've been forgiven of, and Lord, in humility, I serve you. The second idea, and it's up right here as well, the more we love God, the more we realize that he's the only answer for our problems. He commends the centurion. No one has faith like this man. He knows who's in charge, and faith has orders to follow. Uh, Jesus had not run into anybody that would just say, Lord, you just say it and it will be done. But here's this Gentile who only hears about Jesus, 
says by faith, whatever he says will be done. It, it demonstrates that faith is more than just a mental assent. It follows through with obedience. Whatever you say, I have faith that it will happen. I'm sending these people to you to, to make whatever you say or do whatever you say, but don't feel like you have to come under my roof. In fact, the Bible never records that Jesus ever went to the centurion's house, that he actually never even met him, but he healed him. I think that's remarkable. It demonstrates how faith and obedience are locked together. Like, again, that old gospel song, I'm, I'm sure you probably sung it, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. The book of Matthew lets us know that Jesus told the group, Go, and it will be done to you just as you have believed. And when they got back to the house, they, they found nothing but joy. In fact, in Matthew it says that the servant was healed that same hour. The same hour that Jesus prayed and said, it, It's done, the servant gets better. I don't know about you, but that's really good news for me. You know, this pandemic is only one word. Jesus saying, hey, it's over, and it all goes away. He has power. The serv servant who had been near death was up walking around, and the, servant was pro the centurion was probably on his knees thanking God. I think that the amazing thing about Jesus Christ is that when he says go to demons, they go. When he says, come to me, he, he, on, that, on the road to Capernaum, right outside, he says to Matthew, these three words, come follow me. And this guy who is making an absolute killing on taxes gets up and leaves that profession and follows Christ. When he says, come, you come. When they stop, he says to the wind and the sea, stop raging, and they did. He's just on, on the Sea of Galilee, just a few miles from there. He's in complete control of our lives, gang. Let's follow him. Let's serve him. The only, the only uh, part of God's creation that disobeys Jesus is his people. His people. He says to the waves, be still. He says to the grass, go into the furnace or grow, and they grow. But he gives us the free will to choose, either to reject or follow him. One day, all of humanity is going to bow their knee and confess with their mouth, Philippians chapter 2, that he is Lord. That's, that's all settled. But he's going to give us a choice to trust him. It, for some, it will be a deep moment of regret and remorse, and for others, it will be the great satisfaction that finally the entire world that we know is completely under his control. God is full of mercy, but he's also a righteous and just judge. You must turn from your sin and yourself and follow him. Uh, the word faith, there's an acronym, forsaking all, I trust him. Uh, faith, you've got to have faith. That F stands for forgiveness. It's available to everybody. God loved the whole world, the whole world that he gave himself on the cross. Um, the A is that it's available for everybody, everybody in this room. It's not whether you have $1,000. You know, if we said you could buy your way to heaven for $1,000, I think everybody in the room would do what they had to do to come up with the $1,000. But do you realize that the vast majority of our world wouldn't be able to ever come up with that kind of money? It's not a matter of how much you have, but... It's whether you will turn from your sin. That the, the I is it's impossible. The uh, Bible says, uh, if you, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, uh, every man sinned, the Bible says uh, in, in Romans 3, chat, verse 10, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, so it's impossible in your own strength whether you could afford it or not. And the T stands for turn. That means turn from yourself and your sin. And turn to Christ, the finished work of Christ on the cross. Uh, this word turn, I think the theological term is repent. Be sorry for your sin. So you've got to know that you need forgiveness. That it's available to you. 
that it's impossible in your own, in your own strength to get it. Turn from your sin and, and the finished work of Christ that he died on the cross, was buried and rose again. That's what the Bible calls the gospel in Romans 10, 9, 10, and 13. And then the Bible says on H, that stands for heaven. Uh, not only uh, in the hereafter, but for the here and now. Uh, for whosoever shall call upon me shall be saved. Isn't that a really good thing? And most of us have done that in our life, and we're, we would never regret that. Um, it's, it's what makes uh, America great, the forgiveness that we were established on. Uh, could I just lead you in a prayer of, of uh, repentance, of salvation? I know many of you that are here that have come on 4th of July weekend are... Um, committed members at Heritage Park. What a great group of people. And, uh, but, but, you know, behind those masks, I'm not sure I recognize any, anybody or everybody. But let me just say this. God knows your heart. And I'd be remiss if I told you all this and, and got you right to that point. And then I never really actually ask you to step across the line and be saved. So would everybody bow their heads and close their eyes? And if you're listening on on uh, television watching that maybe this prayer is for you because uh, you've never prayed this prayer let me invite you to pray this prayer dear Lord I know that I'm a sinner I know I need forgiveness right now I, I know that you love me that it's available to me but it's impossible in my own good works to ever attain salvation so right now, I turn from myself and from my sin, and I turn to the cross where Jesus loved me so much that he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. Right now, I believe. I believe that you saved me. And I believe that you'll take my sins away not only my past sins, my present sins, but my future sins, and that you prepared for me a home in heaven. Come into my heart and save me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm sure you were blessed by this week's message. And once again, we would love to pray with you about anything that's going on in your life. Please uh, just send us a prayer request or even request somebody to pray with you. And uh, once again, we are uh, asking you to give, give online, um, just give to help the ministry of Heritage Park move forward for the cause of Christ with the gospel of Christ. And so I really hope you enjoyed the worship service today. Um, God bless you and uh, have a great one.